This is our 16th installment in this series on assurance. <clears throat> now, religious uh, flesh, which is the worst of all flesh, like to think in terms of minimum. Now, it's interesting to observe that in Scripture, the Spirit never establishes a minimum, <clears throat> nor a maximum. Actually, once you get your feet on the ground and kind of know what this is all about, spiritual life presumes growth and advance. Now, we're beginning the, our thoughts tonight with the postulate or basic premise that when we come into Christ, we come in with assurance and confidence. I realize there's not a lot made of this, but I aim to make a lot of it. Paul reminded the Thessalonians with whom he spent about three weeks that our gospel, as the gospel we preach, came not unto you in word only. It wasn't just what I, it wasn't just me. But also in power and in the Holy Ghost and, and, and in much assurance. Amen. Amen. I mean, you can't be saved without having some assurance. If you can remember when you were baptized into Christ, you came in with some assurance. You knew your sins were forgiven. I baptized a lot of people. I have no idea how many. But I don't recall anyone ever being baptized and coming up out of the water wondering if they were forgiven. The point I'm making is you started out with assurance. It wasn't the maximum amount of insurance, assurance, but it was assurance. And Hebrews 3, 6 brings up a point there, brings up a point here. Christ is a son over his own house. Whose house are we if, oh boy, now this is, uh, uh, this has some alarming implications, but let's just uh, see what he says. If we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm under the end. So you got to keep what you started out with. You got to keep and get more. Now it's unfortunate that we have to make this observation. But there's a host of people who have less than they did when they came in. This not only is not right, this is not acceptable. God, Jesus didn't die so you could go backward. You weren't born again so you could lose ground. This is a thing that exists. It doesn't make any kind of sense at all, however you look at it. Again, Hebrews 3.14, we are partakers of Christ if... We hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. See, confidence is assurance. That's what it is. The beginning of it. We're holding it. Don't lose what you started out with. You started out with some confidence. There's a, there a kind of a measure of joy. There was a pure conscience. There's a number of things you started out with. Don't lose any of it. In Hebrews 10.25, cast not away therefore your confidence. He didn't say if you have confidence. He assumes you got it. When you come in, this is part of coming into Christ. This is part of being born again. This is part of translating, being translated into the kingdom of God's dear son. There's a measure to which you know where you're at. You know what's happened. You don't know everything about it, but you know enough to have some assurance. 
When we talk about the danger of falling away, it's very real, but we got to have more to say than that, brethren. Someone says, what do you believe? Say, we believe you can fall away. Well, <laughs> well yeah, I understand that, but I mean, we really got to have, <laughs> you got to have something more firm than that. You have something like, we believe that nothing is able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. <laughs> We are persuaded that he that begun a good work in you will perform it till the day of Christ. Yeah, you got to have some of this confidence and assurance. So admittedly, as I, I hasten to say, admittedly, a beginning measure of assurance is not satisfactory to just maintain, but you got to keep that beginning measure and add more to it. Think of assurance as a, a vessel you start out, you got you got some starter dough, I guess they call it. You're making bread, you know. You, you got some, some something to work with. Right off the bat, you got something to work with. And if you feed your soul right, and you subject yourself to right influences, and you fight the good fight of faith, this it'll it'll cause this assurance to blossom and flourish more. Now, the lack of assurance opens for corruption. That's what we're talking about tonight. What is a lack of a, how do you define a lack of assurance? Well, you boil down to its essence, it's not believing. Because yeah. faith is the substance of things hoped for, later versions say the assurance of things hoped for. See, so faith, faith and assurance are in, inseparable. Assurance is an aspect of faith. Amen. So it's not believing. That's the thing that uh, causes lack of assurance. Now, let's have some examples of this. <clears throat> the scene in Israel, Israel is a primary example of this, lived out in the flesh. Now, we've talked about this quite a bit recently, that God took things that happened in the sphere of the spirit and he did them in the flesh. He, he lived them out in the flesh in history. So you could get a handle on get a handle on what's real. So here you have unbelief depicted in Israel. Psalm seventy eight twenty one says the Lord heard this and he was wroth so a fire was kindled against Jacob and anger come up against Israel because they believed not they believed not in God that's a phenomenal statement they believed not in God see now there are all kind of people say I believe in God but I'm weak here and I'm weak there and I don't do this and I don't do that no this is not so this is emphatically not so. No per believing in God is trusting in God. It's not an intellectual assent to the fact that God is. The demons know God is. Because they were in his presence. That's all they know. They were cast out of his presence. Again, it said of Israel, Psalm 78, 22, because they believed not in God and trusted not in his salvation, Though he had commanded the clouds from above and opened the doors of heaven to send down rain and manna and quail. <laughs> That's lack of assurance. Why, just why did they murmur? Why did Israel murmur? They lost their assurance. Yeah. They weren't convinced that God could and that God would. See, that's what we're talking about, lack of assurance. Numbers 13, here's an example of lack of assurance. These are the people now that had been led by God to the promised land. They'd walked through the Red Sea on dry ground. They'd had some skirmishes with the enemy and defeated them. They knew God had promised this land to them. Over 500 years before this, God told Abraham, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you the land of Canaan. You're going to drive the inhabitants out. 
But before that happens, your people, your seed's going to be ruled over by a recalcitrant people for 400 years. They're going to come out with great substance. I'm going to bring them into the land. So this is the promise. People have been holding on. Yeah. Joseph held on to this promise. Remember? Yeah. When you leave, yay, when you leave, take my bones. Yeah. I don't want anything left back here in Egypt. Jacob, when he got ready, does to bury me over in a promised land. I want to be buried in the promised land. Abraham's wife, Sarah, I bury me in the promised land. Abraham's buried in the promised land. So this was a lively consideration. And here's this body of Israelites, and they forgot about that. Here's what it says. They went and they sent out some spies to peruse the land to see if the land was, in fact, what God said it was. Flown with milk and honey and water courses and bronze and gold. And they came back and said, yeah, the, it's, that's uh, precisely the land just like that. However... It's occupied. Well, God told them it's going to be occupied. He said they want to give you houses you didn't build, vineyards you didn't plant, trees. Yeah. You. Of course, it was occupied. I yeah. see they they got to looking looking at who was living there. It scared them. It's, not only were they li people, they were giants in the land. Let's take up the dialogue now. After they had evil spy, ten spies gave this report. It's not everything is cracked up to be, folk. We're going to have to fight. <laughs> we're, we're going to have to fight to, to get the land, and I don't think we got enough soldiers to do it. Numbers 13.30, Caleb still the people, which was a task of itself. I don't know how he did that, but he must, God must have endured him with some power. He steered the people, still the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once. That's a sure talk, you see. At once and possess it, for we're well able to overcome it. But the men that were with him said, we will not be able to go up against the people if they are stronger than we. <laughs> well, we got put it in today's language so people understand. We just don't have enough money. We just don't have the right resources to do what we're going to do. We're going to have... We're not educated enough. We're going to hit the... Oh, Caleb said, listen, let's right now, not right now, while, this, while we're here, let's go up. Well, what caused the people to reject that counsel? They had no assurance. Faith is defined as a substance of things hoped for. Substance of things hoped for is an aphorism for assurance. In other words, faith substantizes or makes real the promises of God to you, Amen. which is assurance. That's what assurance, what you're convinced what God has promised is true. Now, a lack of assurance is a lack of that persuasion. Let's see this uh, in Peter sinking. Remember when Jesus appeared walking on the water? Scared them. They thought, they thought at first it was a spirit. Which I knew right away they weren't from America. <laughs> ah, nobody from America. No, nobody from America would have thought it was a spirit. Very few church members would have thought it was a spirit. It was a different kind of people, folks. It was a different kind of people in those days. They thought it was a spirit. And you remember that Jesus, he's, G, Peter, he waxed bold. He had some assurance. If it's you, command me to come to you on the water. Yeah. Lord says, come. So he had to climb out of the boat to do it, you know, and he's in the middle of a storm. It's, it's not, he's not walking on placid, quiet, yeah. <laughs> still waters. <laughs> he's a big waves and everything. He steps out. He commences to walk with Jesus. He's assured he's right on top of the water. And he, his a vision shifts to the storm. And he wonders, like, what am I doing out here? He begins to sink. But I have to show you how quick Peter was. Are you, how long does it take you to sink? Not, not long. That's right. He didn't say he began to bob. He said he sank, began to sink. And before, before his head went under, he got this out. Lord, save me. The Lord did, and here's what he said. 
O thou of little faith. <laughs> caught him. He caught him. O thou of little faith. <laughs> Wherefore did you doubt? Doubt. Yeah. It's lack of assurance. Amen. You'll sink too. If you don't have assurance, you'll not be able to stay, so to speak, on top of the waters of life. When the storms come, you'll sink. Now, people may say it's a mistake. People may say it's just weak. They have all kinds of explanations for it. Depends if you go to the counselor or not, or the psychiatrist or not. But they've got all kinds of explanations for why people do this. It's in your genes. It's in your blood. It's, uh, it's in the chemical makeup of your body. It's, they've got all kinds of explanations. But Jesus just cuts to the quick. Doubt. See, the kingdom of God has been set up so it won't function where there's doubt. It won't, let me be more precise. It won't function to your advantage where there's doubt. Again, I mentioned the absence or lack of assurance opens for corruption. Doubt is unbelief in its beginning stage. Jesus, there's an example here of this kind of uh, doubt. It has, it's right down to earth where people live. Here's what he said. Now, he's saying this, he's not saying this to a, a lucrative type society that had everything, you know, rich society. And the TV ministers tell us that Christ was rich and disciples were rich. And just, just they don't know what they're talking about. Jesus was rich, but he became poor. That's what the scripture, that's what the scripture says. Right. Here's what he said to these people now who didn't have an abundance. I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, neither for the body, what you should put on. The life is more than meat, the body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens, they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, but God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? Yeah. You'll comfort one another and say, you're better than the birds. You are. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. You're better than the birds. And no birds are starving. Uh -huh. <laughs> and which one of you, by taking any thought, can add one, a cubit, add to a statue a cubit? Well, if you could do that, the happiest one among us would be little Jordan. <laughs> if he could add a cubit or two to his stature. And some adults would be too. If that was the case, then we'd have to say these we got some giant girls among us. We'd have to say they must have a strong faith. <laughs> Which of you by giving thought, taking thought, can add to his stature one cubit? If you be then be not able to do the things which are least <laughs> <laughs> that's the least yeah. why take ye thought for the rest consider the lilies of the field how they grow they toil not nor spin yet I say unto you that Solomon in all of his glory is not arrayed like one of these if then God so clothed the grass which today in the field is in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven how much more shall he clothe you O ye of little faith and uh, seek not, well, this maybe is a little bit too hard. Maybe we shouldn't, this is too strong. Well, I'll read it anyway in hopes that you can receive it. And seek not ye what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, neither be ye of doubtful mind. Amen. Now, some of us, uh, myself included, know what it's like to lose your job. 1958, I lost my job, and there weren't any jobs. We were in the middle of a big recession. I lost my job. And I was tempted to lose heart. But this text came to my mind. This may look hard for me. 
but I cannot afford to be doubt of doubtful mind. Yeah. Yeah. I had to fight not to have a doubtful mind. I mean, this was, I had to fight against that to have a doubtful mind, but I can tell you by experience and that, that mine is minor compared to some people of the world. Don't be of a doubtful mind. A doubtful mind is a lack of assurance. And Satan works with doubtful minds, not God. God works with believing minds. Satan works with doubtful minds. Satan's seeking Roman to and fro, seeking him and may devour. And he's looking for somebody who's got doubtful, a doubtful mind. Ah, he can plant some seeds in there. Now, what kind of impact does uh, unbelief, lack of assurance, doubt, what kind of an impact does this have upon a person? There is a, a kind of a scholastic environment that, that we're living in today in which people think that doubt is almost virtuous. In fact, people have said to me that doubt is a form of faith. <laughs> oh, yeah. You'd be surprised if I told you who said it, too. But it, yeah. But doubt has effects, and they're not good. If doubt was, in fact, the beginning of faith or a kind of a feeble form of faith, then something good could come from it, right? But nothing good can come from doubt. It's a condemned unit. Let not that man think he shall receive anything from God. That's what the scriptures say. Now let's take the experience of Asaph. Something called, caused doubt or a lack of assurance to enter into his mind. This is the 73rd Psalm. You're very familiar with, with it. As for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. Why? We have Brother Asaph, Why? I was envious of the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. There are no bands in their death. They don't seem to die miserable or things just going for them. Their strength is firm. They seem to survive. Got the trumpitis, they can just survive, you know. Got the gatesitis, they just can't survive everything. Whether it's a recession or a depression or somebody can come out. There's no, they, they, they are not in any trouble as other men. They just, <laughs> neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride comes to them about as a chain. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. They are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression and speak loftily. Bra they brag, in other words. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walketh through the earth. No challenge whether God exists or not. Therefore, as people return thither and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them, and they say, how does God know? And is there knowledge of the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. Now he looks back at himself. I have cleansed my heart in vain, washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. <clears throat> if I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of my children. If I tell them how I really feel, everyone think I'm nuts. When I thought to know this, understand it, it was too painful for me. <clears throat> Why is it this way? Why is it when a person tries to do everything he, he should do, he's pretty sure he has, he has confidence that he's, he's been pretty diligent, things just don't work out. They begin to be envious. Assurance begins to wane. But then Asaph added, <coughs> I kept thinking on like this <coughs> until I went to the sanctuary of God. I had to get into the place where God was instead of where circumstance was. Now, you got your choice. Mm -hmm. You can be assured and walk where God is, yep. or you can think about your environment and what's around you and what you're experiencing and what's going against you and how hard life is. You begin to think about those things. And when you do, 
assurance begins to shrivel up. Pretty soon you're not seeing the promised land at all. You're seeing the giants. And you lack boldness to sally forth. Go into the battle. But the devil, he doesn't... <laughs> He doesn't draw back. He doesn't say, all right, I'll, I'll lay off till you get some a little bit more strength. Yeah. He'll crush you. That's Asaph's experience. <clears throat> all right, let's of Israel. Israel lost some assurance, and here's how they reasoned. Isaiah 49, 14. Now, remember, we're talking about when, it's, when lacking in assurance opens for corruption. Isaiah 49, 14. Zion said, the Lord hath forsaken me. My Lord hath begotten me, hath forgotten me. Here's God's reply. Can a woman forget her sucking child? That she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget. Yea, they may forget. Yet will I not forget thee. But all of that means nothing if you're in this state. You think God's forgotten you. Yeah, I don't think I could ever be tempted to think that. No, you know, don't you be careful. David said one time, I said in my haste, I shall never be moved. <laughs> but he was moved. He had to hide, he had to run. Don't you say in your haste, things are going really well, you know, really well. So you, you speak as though you're guaranteed that that situation is going to continue. No, you've got to let assurance do its work. You got to learn, you may, God may be teaching you how to suffer need as well as how to abound. God's instructed me, Paul said, God has instructed me how to abound and how to suffer need. As he taught you that, you, here's an area you can have assurance. Maybe you're, at the, maybe you're at the teaching point where he's teaching you how to suffer need. You can, he, you can survive, and I mean, ravens can bring you bread and flesh. And even during the famine, they can locate a brook. See? Assurance doesn't cave in. See, assurance knows there's going to be a way out of this. I know that this is going to turn out for my salvation. It's going to turn out for my good. I know it. That's assurance. Why did the Corinthians, why were they able to be led astray? Paul spent 18 months there. And they were very fruitful months. They didn't have the troubles that he wrote, wrote to them about until after he left. Then some other people came in. And under these people preached, 2 Corinthians 11, 4, they preached another Jesus, another gospel, and another spirit. Now, brethren... I know it's not fashionable to say this, but we are living in a time when another Jesus and another spirit and another gospel is being preached. You see, how do you know? Because of the way things are going. Same way Paul knew. How did Corinth get to the state where so much corruption was in that church? This is one of the worst churches in the Bible. The church at Corinth. It's the only church we know of where God made some of the people sick and caused some to die. Because they were dawdling around at his table. They were suing one another at the law. They were, some of them were denying that there was even a resurrection of the dead. Some questioned there was an apostle. There were divisions among them, and they were right proud of it. And they were conducting themselves in an unapproved manner around the Lord's table. And they were unmindful of the weaker brethren. Hmm. <laughs> what caused that to happen? I'm suggesting to you it was a lack of assurance. It was a lack of faith. That's why Paul said these words, 1 Corinthians 15. Moreover, brethren, in view of this circumstance, all these circumstances I painted. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, <laughs> the real one 
which I preached unto you, which ye also received, and wherein ye stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which ye received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and so forth. He took them back to the thing that caused assurance, which was the gospel. The, go the, the true gospel message produces assurance in those that believe it. And where there's a lack of assurance, there are only two possibilities. Either the message hasn't been preached, or it has been preached and rejected. And I don't know any other solution to that problem. See, this substantiates. If this diagnosis is correct, then when there are assurance left, the door opened up and this corruption via false teachers, this corruption came into the church and it caused all those deficiencies that Paul named. Amen. It was a deficient gospel that caused those conditions because the gospel they were hearing did not gender assurance. Right. It didn't gender faith. So as a consequence, the door was left ajar uh -huh. for the devil to enter in. Now the same thing stands true for Israel today. It was cut off some of the branches, some, some of the branches were cut off because of unbelief. Romans 11:20 says, "Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off, and thou standest by faith, be not high-minded, but fear. They also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. God is able to graft them in again. What caused them to be cut off? Unbelief. What is unbelief? It's a lack of assurance or a lack of confidence or a lack of persuasion. They didn't believe that Jesus was the Christ, even though he measured up precisely and in every detail to what the prophet said. And when that condition entered in, where there wasn't faith and consequently wasn't assurance, corruption entered in and some of the branches were cut off. <coughs> Unbelief causes people to depart from the Lord. I'm always very concerned when I see people that profess to be Christians that are sloppy about their lives, exposing themselves a minimal amount of exposure to the things of God, involving themselves at what they can see to be the a minimal level. Very concerned about that, because here's how the Scripture speaks on this matter. Hebrews 3.12, Take heed, brethren, 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 take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief, and here's how, you here's how it makes itself known, in departing, from the living God. See, it, that's open for corruption. That's another way of saying open for corruption. So that when you're an evil heart of unbelief can't, do, can't cohabit the heart with faith. One pushes the other out. If faith is embraced, it pushes unbelief out. If unbelief is embraced, it pushes faith out. And when faith goes out, people begin, they cast in a backward stance. They begin going backward. I don't care how much you tell them what they should do and how much you admonish them to go forward. And you can give them a book of guaranteed procedures and so forth. But because they don't have assurance, they're, they're in this situation where the door for Satan is left ajar and nothing can shut that door but faith and assurance. <clears throat> a, lack of, a lack of assurance or persuasion causes misassessment. Now, the first example of it, of course, is at the, at the tree, the foot of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, where Eve was. She, now, she knew what God had said. She could rehearse it. She could, she could quote it for you. She could quote it for you, what God had said about this tree. Now, I'd be interested in finding out what she is doing standing by this tree, but at any rate, someone could say, well, it was in the middle of the garden along with the tree of life. So, well, I can understand it. She... But as soon as unbelief, as soon as Satan 
convince her to push the word of God into the background, to doubt what God had said, <laughs> she misassessed the situation. She looked at the very tree that God had warned her about. She said it was pleasant to look upon. It was good for food and desired to make one wise. And she was wrong in all three points. Amen. Why? See, she lost this assurance. That was after one encounter. That was the first encounter with the devil. While she was in a pure and unsullied state. So that's the first. It led to wrong conclusions. Now Israel, they had, uh, they had some experiences along this line also. Misassessments. Here's Acts 15, 24, 25. Now, they knew God had provided everything they need up to this point. The people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? They didn't say, Moses, go to God on our behalf and ask for water. They didn't say that. Moses did. He cried unto the Lord and showed him a tree which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them. Their complaint, they thought because they couldn't find water or because the water was poison, that none was available. They, they misassessed the situation. And with a very easy remedy, so it was available. Again, Exodus 16. The whole congregation of Israel, of the children of Israel, murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said unto him, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat bread to the full. For he brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Well, they weren't talking like that when they were in Egypt. Their cry went up. Their cry went up to God of the bitter bonds. They weren't talking like this when they were in Egypt. What happened? They lost their assurance. Now, these are the same people that crossed the Red Sea on dry ground that saw their enemies washed up on the shore. These are the same people. The same people heard God thunder out of Zion uh, and it like this scared them to death. They said, well, all the Lord has said we will do. You know, they, they, this is the same people. What happened? They lost their assurance. And so they misassessed, misassessed things. The scripture says, by faith, Hebrews 11, by faith they came out of Egypt. Yeah, right. And by unbelief they fell in the wilderness. Yeah, <laughs> Same people. Yeah. Now be clear, the lack of assurance reveals the lack of faith. Unsure, people are unsure, for instance, of the integrity of his word. Yeah, I know the Bible says that, but to be unsure, unsure of the wages of sin. See, no person, no person would willingly commit sin if they were thinking about the wages of sin. The wages of sin is death. They're not persuaded of the promises. This is what happens when you're not, when you don't have assurance the promises were way back there on a the back burner. You're not thinking about those promises at all. You're thinking about your situation, how you can get better, and how instant relief can come, but you're not thinking about these promises. Why? That's what lack of assurance does. Makes you forget the promises. Makes you unsure of divine acceptance. If you have an extensive bout with temptation, you might get to the point where you say, I wonder, well, I wonder if I am saved. I, I wonder if I am in or out. I've talked to people like this. And I've been tempted to think this way myself. By the grace of God, I've been able to recover. Doubting your sonship. If you doubt that God's received you, your hope. <laughs> God can make you stand. I understand that. But you can't remain perpetually in that state. Because assurance is, the longer it lingers, the wider the 
lack of assurance, the longer it lingers, the wider the door of entrance to corruption becomes. Not sure of eternal destiny. So you ask somebody. Some denominations, I'll ask this question. If you died tonight, would you go to heaven? Well, there's nothing wrong. It is a good thing to think about. Some people say, well, I hope so. I'd ask sometime that different places I've been, are you going to go to heaven? Well, I hope so. Not hope like the Bible hope. I hope, I hope kind of wishing that this is the case. I'm not, not very sure about it. But see, if you're not sure of your heavenly home, if you're not sure whether you're going to be on the right hand or the left, if you're not sure whether the angels are going to gather you with the wheat or with the tares, and you're not sure about this, it gives Satan an advantage. So how can I remedy this? Well, you've got to determine to remedy it, first of all. If you determine to remedy it, God will show you how to do it. I mean, we don't have a procedure to remedy lack of, lack of faith or unbelief or lack of assurance or doubt. We don't have a, a procedure to remedy that. <laughs> if we did, we'd all be rich. <laughs> but we don't have anything like that. So you've got to get to the point where you concentrate on God instead of circumstance. Now you got, you got your choice, what you can concentrate on. You concentrate on God, and then when your eyes are full of God and your mind saturated with him, then, then you look back at the circumstance, and it looks different. See, I know this is going to turn out. This, this is going to turn out. God's going to finish this work. Or you may even say, well, I'm ready. To, I can see the end is near. I'm ready to be offered now. That's assurance talking. Not sure of the promises. That's part of a lack of assurance. Now, the debilitating effects of assurance, we've commented about it. People who depart from the faith, they lack assurance. They shall, some shall depart from the faith. 1 Timothy 4.1, they shall depart from the, they'll quit believing. Why? Their doubt flowered out till it was full unbelief. Never view doubt as something that's tolerable. That's right. Amen. Wage war against it. Amen. People draw back. The scripture says Hebrews 10, 28, if any man draw back, this is God said this. God said, if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. That's, this is a matter of record now. That's right. If any soul draw back, God says, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. I'll not be inclined to that person. I'll not be disposed to deliver that person. I won't hear that person. That person's got to, he's got to overcome that doubt. He's got to ask for wisdom from above. He's got to somehow, he's got to remedy this situation. If any soul draw back, my soul have no pleasure in him. If you think God's going to bless people that he doesn't have pleasure in, well, you're just wrong. That's all. People who lack assurance didn't let the word of Christ dwell on them richly. Now, Colossians 3.16 says that. Let the word of Christ, let it now, let it dwell richly in you. Don't let the word of God enter in and you devote yourself to some other pursuits and you gradually push it out. Let it dwell there richly. Let the word of Christ do its work in you. Ponder it. Meditate upon it. Do your very best to comprehend it. Jesus gives a hard saying, like if any man hate not his father, mother, brother, sister, and the end of his own life, also he can't be by the disciple. Let that dwell in you richly now. Let it dwell in you richly. If any man says all things are possible, Jesus says all things are possible to him that believes. Let that, I'll let that dwell in you. Ponder that. Don't ponder, well, yeah, but can he do this? And I'm not sure, but he can do that. And let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. No man's able to pluck you out of my hand. 
Let that dwell in you richly now. Take your mind, let it do its work in you. But if you let other things enter in, it'll rob you. And we have this word from the Lord. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Can anyone tell us how can we can escape the wrath of God Amen. if we neglect his salvation? Yeah. Was the only way you can neglect his salvation is for a lack of faith, an evil heart of unbelief to enter in, doubt to enter in, see, lack of assurance. That's what causes this condition to exist. Now the Salvation of God is calculated to produce assurance. Amen. I, th I think I saw this many years ago, so maybe, as, maybe as many as 50 years ago, that you can't think upon the things of God without it being profitable. So if you fill your mind with the, the promises of God and the gospel of Christ and this sort of things, it's all calculated to produce assurance. You can't make yourself assured. You can't by act of your will become assured. What your will is involved in is to take hold of what God has made available to you and when you do this, then that's what produces the assurance. And a lack of assurance is when you didn't take hold of that. And when you didn't, Judah was right. It's like the evil spirit cast out. He came back. Nobody's living in the house. So he brought back seven spirits worse than himself. So if salvation is neglected... It will not advance, and if it doesn't advance, you won't have assurance. And if you don't have assurance, you'll be scared when Jesus comes instead of ready to meet him. Right. Uh -huh. So as best I can, I encourage you, seek a full assurance, the full assurance of faith. Seek a full assurance, the full assurance of hope, see? Seek a full assurance, the full assurance of understanding. Let your, let your assurance be a, a very strong part of your spiritual constitution. It, it may not happen overnight. It may happen suddenly when all of a sudden things just kind of fall together for you and you, I know whom I believed, and I'm persuaded he's able to keep what I've committed against that day. It may happen in an instant. It may. But don't be satisfied until it does. Because as long as there's not assurance, Satan has access to you. Who is our exhortation? Michael, okay. <laughs>